in, in 2006, he wrote, produced, and presented Decadence with reflections on modern life in the West in six episodes of 25 minutes each. In 2008, based on the success of the SBS TV series, Priya began work on a feature documentary entitled Decadence, A Decline of the Western World. So it's very appropriate that he's here tonight. Extremely, almost providential. Uh, this was released in December 2011, so it's hot off the press, to critical acclaim and played for five weeks in the cinemas in Sydney and Melbourne, and more recently in Newcastle, New South Wales and Perth, Western Australia. We welcome Priya Wallingham. steady circle of stern aunties and rogue uncles. We stayed under the radar of the adults, slipping out after school to the cinema to gawk at Bond movies, a wonder world of Aston's Baccarat Monte Carlo and bikinis. And so life in post-colonial Asia meant that we all looked to the West with a certain awe. Our first real contact with the West was the snowy Christmas cards we received from friends and relatives over there. When I first arrived during the 70s, it was all this and more. Bells in spring, the summer breeze, antiquated schools with lush playing fields, majestic democracies led by towering heroes, liberated sex, liberating drugs, and licentious rock and roll. Further to the west bloomed the spectacle of America. Bigger, brasher, glamorous. This was the shimmering uplands, the magical Disney world of movies and shiny cities that reached for an improbable heaven. We all wanted to come to America to see if it was so. To talk like them. And eat hot dogs in the park like them. But like a deliciously intoxicating party, have we all stayed too long? We're told we're richer, healthier, smarter, and happier than ever before. Are we? Inequality is growing throughout much of the world. The median income for an American family has declined in the last eight years. There is that it's a lack of confidence more than anything else that kills a civilization. We can destroy ourselves by cynicism and disillusion just as effectively as by bombs. Let's get this straight. The West has led the world in everything from commerce to culture. But 
how many people in the West are confident that the future will be better than the past? Surveys over the past decade or two in many Western societies reveal levels of public anger and anxiety about the changes that are taking place that simply weren't there 30 to 50 years ago. They feel that when it comes to things like individual freedom or material abundance, we now have too much of a good thing or don't know where to stop. And that, to me, is a classic expression of decadence. To Scotland, to, uh, there are four chapters that I'm going to deal with, so if you have to look at your time, there are four to go, okay? <laughs> Democracy. Allow me to hop, skip, and jump through history. The hop. 3,000 years ago, the Greeks and Romans cultivated Western civilization in the Mediterranean. Democracy, as we know it today, began to take shape in 1215. Skip to the Magna Carta, which promoted the rule of law and enshrined individual freedom, both of which even the king was bound to. And then we jump to the 1520s when Hugh Latimer preached the English Reformation from a modest pulpit in Cambridge University. Some believe this was the spark that eventually lit the Industrial Revolution and the dominance of the Protestant Anglosphere for the past 300 years with its principal trademark, democracy. For the last 150 years, we have recorded and lived amongst some significant leadership, significant, Lincoln, Churchill, Hitler, Roosevelt, Stalin, Kennedy, Reagan, Thatcher, intellectually gifted or ably assisted by bright lieutenants, the common thread is that government was society's highest calling. Today, many of our best and brightest migrate to the big end of town. Why wouldn't you, when the American president earns $400,000 a year, while the top 10, the average salary of the top 10 CEOs of America in 2010 was $43 million. So do the maths, follow the brain drain. So we end up largely with a B-team political leadership, B-graders that spruik brand democracy and make no mistake that our democracies are for sale. Forever it was thus, but now our middle brow political management struggles to stop the corporate tail from wagging society's dog. And they struggle with the media between, as Joe said, feeding chooks and sleeping with the enemy. Q News Corp. The basis to a democracy is an informed opinion. But where do you go for information these days? The newspapers are dying along with their online presence, where you can't tell the news from the advertising. On TV, everyone is either laughing, dancing, singing or cooking. And radio is manned by millionaires pretending to be every man. As we despair at our increasingly bland centrist political machinists, we then seek to impose this flawed democratic model on wacko countries in expensive bloody wars that we lose. Our hypocrisy is lethal. We sell guns, bombs, tanks, fighter jack jets to perfumed kleptocrats and growling warlords who in turn use them against us. Back in 1983, Saddam was a friend and client. In 2006, we effectively hanged him. Talk about buyer beware, Saddam. <laughs> What's clear is that the line between the good guys and the bad guys is not clear. And so, those desperate countries are just not listening anymore. They too can now spell hypocrisy, and they have new courtesans to attend, from Russia and India and Brazil and Korea and China, who come bearing money without the lecture. Money. When did debt become credit? I'm an ordinary man and I was brought up to believe that you had to save to buy something. You can't run the household budget on debt, so how do you run a country's economy on debt? America's national debt is $15 trillion. That's now slightly more than its GDP. For all our miracle economy talk, Australia's, Australia needs more than $1 billion a day to avoid default on its foreign debt. Australia is one of the most indebted nations on earth, with external debts of over $2 trillion and a debt-to-GDP ratio exceeding 100%. Australia sits well within the field of countries facing economic chaos 
if our terms of trade slow, as they will eventually. The pundits, who all fail to predict the GFC, will tell you that our debt is largely private, but as the GFC proved, guess who ends up carrying that debt? And in Europe, things are worse. For all its chocolate box beauty and resolute traditions, Europe's lifestyles are not sustainable. That continental theme park is diminishing, thanks to low birth rates and aging populations, all adrift on a sea of debt. Sure, there are babies being born there, but like America, it's the immigrants who are making whoopee. So, old white Europe as you knew it, and the ascended neo-Nazi parties know it, is fading to black. Contrary to some noise from the sidelines, the West's other glittering trademark, capitalism, works, and works well. Look around you. From Sydney Harbour to Silicon Valley, capitalism rewards risk and hard work. It just needs a bridle. Philosopher and oft-quoted father of capitalism, Adam Smith, said that with money comes moral responsibility. Imagine that. <laughs> Today, if we can't put a price on it, it's not worth having. We even try to value the invaluable, like happiness, whatever that is. We're told that money doesn't buy, but we continue to buy. And as technology zooms ahead, so does our satisfaction span at acquiring the latest or best. It's called the speed of happiness. Researchers in America have measured it. Joe Bloggs bought a BMW X5. How long did his sense of achievement, satisfaction and fulfillment last Every time he got into that car, a year, eight months, it was one week. <laughs> it's a sell job, on a grand scale, the merchandising of life. And just like democracy, we're exporting our economies. The Western world has achieved hard-won labor laws that govern the way we work and are paid by outsourcing our labor to countries like China, India, and Indonesia. We can conveniently sidestep those laws and responsibility just to widen the profit margin. The West hectors the rest of our free market fairness, and yet by extension we employ their children to make our clothes. The gurus of globalization tell us it's a win-win. We get cheaper goods while the, our factories help employ their sweating masses. But our prices keep rising while equality, while quality drops. Western communities lose blue-collar labor, which turns us into boring white-collar societies like Switzerland. And Charlie Chan gets rich off the backs of kids and cutting corners because he can. Adam Smith would be turning in his grave. Education and culture, chapter three. Education, it's the West's greatest achievement. Lopped off the top from aristocracy and clergy, education was dragged down and offered to the masses. A right for one and all to blossom in any meadow. I was sent to boarding school. For hundreds of years, a bastion of the British establishment, where anyone who could afford it send their sons and daughters for a liberal education. Latin, literature, science, sport. Further upstream, illustrious universities, which have been questioning everything since the 14th century, came into their own, set within beautiful, serene gardens, great inspiring halls dedicated to classics, law, humanities, science, teaching us how, how to answer, how, teaching us not how to answer questions, but question answers, opening the mind to the wisdoms of yesterday and the dreams of tomorrow. Education made the West the West. Through broad learning, the most successful civilization in history has shaped a stout middle class, more people than ever able to share in the wealth of a society. A steady income, a home of your own, a car or two, beef and burgundy every day, travel, leisure time. Once the preserve of a few, the good life is now available to the majority. Above all, it's about living as you wish. With its origins in ancient Greek philosophy, individualism is a Western word, and it came into its own in the 60s. Those good revolutions, civil rights, women's lib, kicking back Vietnam, the pill, sex, drugs, rock and roll, for each and every Westerner to define their inner individual. The 60s social revolutions enhanced the middle class, increased the richness of an ordinary life with political and cultural freedoms yet to be understood elsewhere in the world. This was the broadest point in the river, and America led the way. But 
it was corrupted. The slogan of freedom for all became no one can stop me from what I want to do. And then, guess who crashed the parties? Clive Hamilton says, what marketers sell us is a belief in independence, a belief that you can create a true, independent, free sense of who you are by buying this product or that one. It's a manufactured sense of self. This is the way in which those great ideals of the 60s of authenticity, of independence, of freedom, have become corrupted into this ersatz form of freedom and independence sold to us by the market. Which brings me to the central thesis of this essay, that after 300 years, the West has peaked, and it peaked in the 60s. Once the political idealism of that movement was eroded, thanks to Americans shooting their leaders, you were left with this, if it feels good, do it, hedonism. That basically paved the way for the consumerism of later decades. The swinging, the swinging 60s, hijacked in the 70s by merchants, valued, packaged, and sold back to mindless consumers as culture. Selling you what to eat, drink, and think, how to live, love, and die in the land of the free. The corruption of those 60s values has spread further and deeper back into education, that wonderful crucible of Western culture, now in thrall to a new master. Critical thinking and critical thinking to conquer the impossible and husband inspiration has been challenged ever since economic buffets took over the campus and turned students into consumers and brilliant staff into part-time beggars. Time is money and thus education more than ever is about the finite and the profitable, less why and more how much less humanities and more commerce, turning us into a society of intelligent fools who can count but can't think. Western education is returning to where it came from. The best schools for the rich, while universities flog market-friendly degrees, like we really need more lawyers and MBAs. Education allows us to question and not just blindly accept what is thrown at you. But who's got the time and effort anymore to sift through the daily bilge, where news is entertainment and vice versa? It's back to bread and circuses, no longer able to distinguish between quality and kitsch. We're sliding into a junk culture, a large chunk of which is served up by Hollywood, where most of us take our cultural cues from today. Be it the neuroses of Woody Allen, to the gyrations of the Kardashians, or the X Factor, we all want to be famous. For what? And sexy, apparently. In a youth-obsessed culture, we're sexualizing our children, while internet porn is warping young male perceptions of women. Two quick surveys in America. 17-year-old males would rather download porn and masturbate than go out with girls. Another study recorded, another study recorded shock by young men at seeing female pubic hair. Any wonder? why misogyny is on the rise. Which brings us to family. Families are good for us. We do better in work and life in a family. But rampant individualism is poisoning the conventional nuclear family. We're marrying less, and, those, and for those that do, nearly half end in divorce. We're having less babies. To maintain a population, birth rate <coughs> needs to be 2.1 children per woman. In the West, it's 1.9 and much lower in, West, in Western Europe. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's five. Do the maths. And family life gets darker. One out of five American teens is a cutter. They cut their skin. They say they do it to feel. That they become so numb to life that they cut in order to feel alive. Male youth suicide in the US, Australia, and a number of other Western countries in the second half of the 20th century has more than tripled. Why? When in doubt, traditionally, we turned to the church. Christianity is a foundation stone of Western civilization. Our laws, morals, ethics, our sense of empathy, compassion, charity, and even our work ethic all have their roots in Christianity. But the mainstream churches are empty. There's grim disillusionment amongst once mighty congregations with God's offices and their high sacred vows.
poverty, chastity, and obedience, lost in a muddy scrum of power, patriarchy, and pedophilia of all the taboos. Meanwhile, the pop god churches are churning through the numbers by blurring the line between God and mammon and rock and roll. There's no joy on the other side. The frothing atheists pit the best of science against the worst of religion. Try the best of religion versus the worst of science. Besides, all atheists offer is this material world. Yeah, got that. What about love and all things intangible? There's an epidemic of meaninglessness, a feeling that all the old values that used to be so important have been eroded and lost. No more history, no heroes, no God. Conclusion. Democracy, capitalism, education, family, Christianity, all great pillars of Western civilization, but they are corroding. I haven't said anything radically new, all this is familiar, so what am I saying really? Well, I was fortunate enough to have been sent here in my youth to partake and prosper in the West. This was as good as it gets. But I worry about Kenneth Clark's line that it's a lack of confidence more than anything that kills a civilization. We can destroy ourselves by cynicism, disillusion, just as effectively as by bombs. I made the film to raise a flag, to ask if anybody else feels like I do about a decline in cultural confidence. It seems to me that we do think about it, but no one's talking about it. And from my travels, especially in the US, it still appears that the West just assumes that it is forever, while it is politically, economically, and socially obvious that it's not. We now love without longevity, consume without confidence, and live without meaning. We're just buying stuff to fill a hollow culture, and demand is way over supply. The last time I asked, to sustain our current consumption, we need seven Earths. And there are a billion Chinese and Indian middle class consumers coming online. And who's going to say no to them? With aging populations and economies heading south via the east, the West is not doomed, but will soon be irrelevant and under new management by bigger, older cultures which never really understood the West's greatest virtues of liberalism, law, and limitless imagination. I cherish my weekends. I like my wine, women, and song. But you know that other old phrase, you don't know what you've got until it's gone? Well, so much of the West is going, going. Thank you. <laughs>